character combination. So if you had one, two, three, four, five, it's going to create one, two, three, four on each separate line. And so it's every single combination, and you'll see in this, see how it's just a, a lot of single digits. And it takes every possible combination out of those five characters that I cracked earlier. And so what you do with this is you would like sort dash u to make it unique. And I think I meant to name that new file. Well, newest file. So, and now we only have one of each combination because you're going to come up with a lot of the same. So you can see now all the combinations that it's created. The idea behind password fingerprinting is now taking this word list and it's taking this word list, which what did I call that newest file? And, and running it on each side. So you're trying to fingerprint what, what other people at that company, for instance, might use as, as their, their password file. And so I'm outputting that to, oops, what did I forget? Oh, it did. Oh, we're not gonna be using the GPU on this box. <laughs> but what I did this earlier and I took, I took these the first one was I first created the NTLM 5 chart dictionary from the brute force. I ran the expander on it and I called it the expanded dictionary. This is all from the 30,000 NTLMs from, from the DEF CON contest. Then this R1 is when I ran it, the expanded dictionary on both sides of using Hashcat. So on the left and the right side. And this is my R1 is the, the first run through of, of those NTLM hashes. So, this, this is uh, like one pattern we noticed they used a lot was DEF CON, for instance. And so they would capitalize certain letters, add digits at, in certain locations, uh, stuff like that. And so, we took, after you run through once, the whole idea of fingerprinting is you're constantly expanding. Your, your list of dictionary, your dictionary list, basically. So it's going to constantly get longer and longer. And in the beginning, you may end up cracking 600 of the NTLM hashes to begin with. After you run the expander on it you, and run it through again through OCL Hashcat, you may end up with 650 hashes now or something like that. And you're going to constantly expand it, run more, expand it, run more. You also want to take take it, cut out of the loop. It's basically, Adam called it the looping process, which is you run a dictionary attack against it, you take all the hashes out, you run the expander on it, then you run that new dictionary on it again and again, and you just keep expanding it. So your list continually gets bigger and bigger and you're gonna come up with newer and newer passwords. At certain points in the process, you wanna cut out of it, take the dictionary that you've created and maybe add two uh, characters to the end of it, which could be lowercase, they could be digits, special characters, anything like that. And, and you're going to want to add those to the end because it's going to come up with newer, newer combinations. You take the crack pack, cracked hashes, the passwords out of there, run it through the expander again, and then continue the attacks. I'm just going to go back to this tool server here real quick. Because I can show a basic brute force, for instance, with... Uh, OCL hashcat. Do you have hashes in here? Oh, those yeah, are NTLMs. So we'll just output them in real time. Have you noticed a significant difference in the speed between like a 32-bit compiled and 64-bit compiled version of hashcat? I don't know specifically, Martin. Just, it, it, just a memory addressing. It can hold more in memory, basically, so it can do more, theoretically. Um, uh, all my machines are 64-bit, except, but I can tell you that on Backtrack, the hashcat is just as fast as it is on my Windows laptop, and Backtrack's only 32-bit. So this this command right here is just a basic hashcat command where we're telling hashcat to crack the hashes that are in that NTLM file, that text file right there. We're telling it to use it 80 threads. Then we're telling it that we're setting a group of char sets with that dash one. 
and the group of char sets is lowercase digits, special characters, and uppercase. And then we're telling it to we're telling it to try to brute force seven characters. So you can see how uh, even in a brute force, there's a left and a right side. So we've got four variables on the left side, and this means char variables means characters three variables on the right side. And so what it's going to do is try, for that one that it puts there, it's going to try every lowercase character, every digit, every special character on a US keyboard, and every uppercase character. And so when we do this, it takes a second to fire up all these GPUs. But once it does, you can see it's already cracking hashes in real time here. But so you can see right now on these NTLMs, oh, I didn't even specify NTLM and it's cracking this. Those must be MD5s in <laughs> that NTLM file. So that's why you never got it. <laughs> so those are, those are really MD5s. I should have also specified the type of hash here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit that and see if we actually get any NTLM. That was the oh. practice list Minga gave me for the demo oh, competition. No he told me they were NTLM. So with Hashcat, you actually have to specify a type of hash, right? And so typically you might get a password from, again, PHP BB or something like that. And depending on version will depend on how it's hashed, how the password's hashed in the database. And so um, typically the default on Hashcat is MD5, and which is also dash M zero, oops, zero, like that, which is just specifying MD5. Now NTLM is dash M1000, and so we'll see if these are actually NTLMs. I think they're just going to all be MD5s. So the dash M specifies NTLM, and you'll see, I bet they are just MD5s. That's hilarious. <laughs> So this this shows when it when it's first fired up, you'll see that we actually have we have four GeForce GTX 295s, and each of them has two GPUs in it. So it looks like eight actual CPUs or GPUs in this case. And so we're cracking NTLMs at at around 750 million per GPU, which is around six billion combinations a second. So it, this is this is actual this is fairly rare. There's not many of these around. I bet it is. I bet it is. So, um, but you can see, so we've got seven character brute force we can do in, in th just over three hours, and that's every single character set. So it's 96 times 96 times 96 times 96 times 96, seven times, which is however many combinations that says down there. So <laughs> trillion or something. Or quadrillion, something like that. Load. Yeah, it's a tough I need some commas there. <laughs> so, but again, to go back to, to OCL Hashcat in general and password cracking in general, it's way more than just having the biggest machine and the most power. Uh, for instance, at Hashcat, the password pro team, I think, had five or six more members than we did on our team. And they also, this also gives you an idea how good OCL Hashcat is. They also used OCL Hashcat even though they developed GPU password cracking software themselves. They know that OCL Hashcat is superior. So, they, um, admitted, they admitted in the end that yeah. they were using our tools too. Yeah, and so yeah. anyway, it's OCL Hashcat is really phenomenal when it comes to password cracking. And it, again, it, it really deals with when I first started using it, I was like, this is so complex that it doesn't, it's, it's going to take too much to learn. I'd rather just throw something in and brute force it and be done with it. I mean, I'm not somebody who cracks passwords on a daily basis. So um, it's, it's really great because it shows you that the pattern matching, the rule sets, the dictionaries you use, the real world scenarios, that's really where you're going to be able to crack the most passwords. And so flipping that, creating your own passwords or enforcing a password policy, you want to make sure that people aren't using real real words or, you know, just taking a word and adding numbers or leadifying it, as they say. You want to make sure that it's combinations that don't mean anything and don't relate to anything. Or if they're using, you know, something else, you want to make sure they use sentences or, or longer longer passwords. Um, so... Sort of negate rainbow tables it does. I mean, they're still there, don't get me wrong, but like one of our, our friends, uh, another guy that hangs out in the Hashcat channel, just created a um, 
seven character lowercase and digit rainbow table for MD5 hashes, for instance. And it, so you can literally look up any MD5 hash mm-hmm. that's got a seven character or less password in less than like 0.5 seconds. So he created four or five text lists and separated them by by directory. And it's just, I think he said it was 600 gigs or something. It was something yeah. crazy, even for just seven characters. Right. Right. The, the, the problem with rainbow tables is space. You know what well, I mean? It's huge. Yeah, I mean, it's huge. Like, we have this. I mean, we're using like 20 or 30 gigs for this box uh, tops, you know, versus 600 gigs for rainbow tables. And that, that would only be the seven characters. So the, the right. GPUs themselves, specific, this is another reason GPU password cracking is amazing, is the GPUs are making it where... Yeah. It's it's happening so fast. Rainbow tables are way less important. But for instance, like so, we're cracking six billion NTLMs. I think we cracked something like nineteen billion per second MySQL passwords. But on the flip side of that, WPA we only crack at one hundred twenty thousand combinations a second. So there's certain technologies where you know rainbow tables could still make sense. WPA is obviously not one, but. Um, you know, in, in certain situations where they don't. Here in the near future, I would guess that it, I mean, things are going to get so fast if you don't have 14 character plus long passwords. I mean, can somebody can. 15, 14. Did, hashcat 14. will do up to 14. Because that's right now. now. I mostly just mess with uh, domain cache credentials. If you're doing WPA with ha- hashcat, you have to use the, uh, the SID as the salt in the end. You're talking about if you we if don't we don't DES, crack WPA with Ashcat doesn't crack WPA. No, oh, WPA is different. You're talking about DES, and so it works. Anything that's salted works in the exact same way, except for you just put hash. Uh, you either have a salt file, like if all the hashes have a common salt, uh, like in uh, what was that we did? Oracle 10, for example, they had a common salt. Is it really a salt if it's a common salt? No, it, <laughs> it's not. what he's saying is, is you might have one salt for a thousand passwords in one scenario, but oh, okay. you may also have a thousand passwords with a thousand salts and you don't even know how they match. So Hashcat will allow you to take all the hashes and put them in one file and a thousand different salts and put them in one file and it will try every combination on every password, every hash and every salt. You see, until you come up with a thing. It makes the number of combinations infinitely bigger, however... It's there's there's scenarios where that could happen. You, you know what I mean. It also when you're talking about cracking salted hashes, you're talking about doing things in a much slower fashion than you are if you if it's just an MD5 hash, for instance, because it's got a depending on like if you're cracking a thousand hashes at a time because it's it's all different. It can't it can't apply the same salt to everyone, so it's got to try every combination on on that hash every single time. But it's still significantly faster because the same problem applies to CPU-based crackers. Anytime a salted hash is, is uh, just by default more secure than a non-salted hash because it's more difficult to crack. Only in large quantities. Now one here or one there isn't going to be that big of a difference. But when you're talking about thousands of passwords... And it makes pre-computation attacks like rainbow tables pretty damn... Uh, impossible. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's exactly yeah. why you can't have terabytes. Or that's why you can't have WPA rainbow tables because every. Right. Actually, I've seen them, but the thing is that they're very they're, limited. They're you have to have yeah, throw like in. Like yeah, you know, SID has to be hashed. Like right. it, it'll gra- crack it if you use a common web pa- oh, it's common WPA password, and your SID happens to be linked sys. I mean, yes, just to give exactly. you an idea, we made some WPA tables in offensive security, and they contain 64 million words. And one ESSID and the table for one ESSID is 1.9 gigabytes. So that just gives you an idea of the size and the space. And for example, we crack, you know, going to WPA, we crack WPA passwords. We can try 980 million words um, in less than three hours. So that makes rainbow tables for WPA are kind of a thing of the past. All that's going to be happening is this GPU stuff is going to get faster and faster and faster. Can you do, can you show the dictionary with the letters at the end? Just because I got it in my slides. And, like just dictionary on the left mask and then, I mean four numbers on the right mask. Oh yeah, side. like um, do you I, have have a, to, I bet those are MD5s. I change you it don't to have a rock Do big lists. Big list. Now, it, most of the command line options are the same in both versions of Hashcat? Uh, they are OCL hash 